our passage today, we, we find uh, Paul's prayer for Christians in Ephesus. In, in other words, it's, it's what Paul wished for them, Christians, to have. Um, see, what, what you're wishing for in your prayers, in, in your deepest desire, reveals a lot about who you really are. So in a way, when we listen to Paul's prayer, it, we can take a peek at, at Paul's heart for Christians, for you and me. So next time you, um, you hear someone praying in private, um, secretly, if you listen, what they're praying for, uh, listen carefully what, to, what that person is asking, because you, you, you can take a peek of what is important, what's the deepest desire of that person. I'm not talking about listening to someone praying in public because people can make things up uh, in public, but in secret, when they pray in secret, in private, uh, you, you, can, you can hear their heart's desire, what's important to them. Uh, for, for example, uh, parents, uh, when, what would you pray for your children in secret? When, 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 when your children are not listening, uh, what do you pray for them? What do you wish for them? Do you pray so that they do well in school? Uh, do you pray that they, they be a, a good and obedient son or daughter? Or do you pray that they might have a successful career, find a good spouse? What would you pray for them? Or, or do you pray for them to be a godly person? Who love Jesus. Now, Christian, if you're Christian parents, let me ask you, how often do you pray that? That you pray for your child, for your son and daughter to be a godly person who loves Jesus all their lives? Or do, do you even pray for them to have deep compassion for those who do not have a relationship with Jesus? Do you pray for them to be generous towards those who are needy? How much of those do you pray compared to the first group of prayers? You know, do well in school, have a good career, be a good son or daughter. See, when, when you pray for your children, it reveals your heart, who you really are, what's important to you. Now, your deepest desires, you see. Now, if you're not a parent yet, if you don't have children yet, ask yourself, what, 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 what do you pray for, for yourself? How much of your prayer is asking God to transform your heart to be more like Jesus? Do you pray like that? Do you say, Jesus, uh, God, help me to be more like Jesus every day. Help me to be more loving, to be more generous, to be more selfless. Do you pray like that? See, in the midst of all this COVID um, outbreak, it's easy for us to focus on the pragmatic, on the immediate, and forget about the more important things, our character. See, Christian life is all about Christ-likeness, about sanctification, to be more like Jesus, to glorify God. Yet, oftentimes, our prayer is so focused on the pragmatic. Lord, help me to get through this. Help me to get through that. Uh, see, Christians, uh, by definitions, are always a work in progress. So if you're a Christian, you, you are a work in progress. So I've, I've seen a, a bumper sticker one says before, be patient, I'm, I'm a work in progress. And Christian is a work in progress. We, we're not done yet. We are not like Jesus yet. We are not perfect yet. Uh, the meaning that when, when you, you don't become perfect the moment you became a Christian, you don't become perfect. Rather, you, we continually to grow into Christ-likeness. We are, yes, we are justified instantly the moment we put our faith by grace in Jesus. We are justified instantly. Yet, our sanctification, our holiness, our Christ-likeness is progressive. It's ongoing. It's a growing thing. So if you're a Christian, this is what it means. If you're a Christian... You should be more generous today than a year ago. You should be more selfless today than a year ago. You should be more loving today than a year ago. Now, 
But if we are honest, uh, we, we've seen too many, including ourselves even perhaps, uh, who haven't seemed to progress much at all in our generosity, in our patience with one another, in our selflessness. Why? Why, why is that so? I think it is because we, we don't desire them. Hence, I was inviting people, us to, to listen to our prayers. We don't desire them. We don't pray for them. We, we don't want them. There's something more that we desire above those things. We don't ask for them in our prayers, do we? We ask for many things, but we don't ask like Paul did in his prayer. That's what we're going to look at this morning. Paul's prayer for you and me, for Christians. So this passage this morning, it's in, in a sense, it's about Paul's prayer for you. So therefore, uh, allow us to, to take, peek, take, take a peek into Paul's heart. And we can learn what is important to the Apostle Paul. And, and why is it important for him? And why is it important for him? And why, is it, why should it be important for you and me as well? Okay, so that's what we're going to look at this morning. Uh, so first thing we're going to look at is who is Paul praying to? And what is Paul praying for? And why is Paul praying for them? Okay, so who is Paul praying to? What is Paul praying for? And what, why is Paul praying for them? Okay, so the first one, who is Paul praying to? This is the most straightforward, I guess. Uh, if you look at verse 14, uh, Ephesians 3, verse 14, it says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. So just like Jesus, the Apostle Paul prayed to the Father. Now, this is, I don't want you to miss this because praying to the Father is crucial. He's not praying to God only. Yes, he's praying to God, but he's, most importantly, Paul is praying to the Father. See, this is important for us to remember when we pray. We pray not only to the all-powerful God, but we are praying to a loving Father. Not only is the Father powerful and has the capacity to give what we ask for in prayer, yes, he is that, but he's willing to give generously as well to his children. Not only is powerful, but he's generous, he's loving. That's what a father is. Now, another thing about a father is a father speaks of authority. Well, maybe not so much in, in, in Australian or even American cultures, in Western cultures, but in many Asian cultures and certainly in Paul's culture, father speaks of authority. Children dare not call their father by name in many cultures because it speaks of authority. You show respect. Um, so when a father asks his children to do something, children listen. Why? Because he is their father. And, and father, oftentimes when children ask, why, why? Why do I have to do this? Why do I have to do that? The father simply said, because I'm your father. And you listen. You do what I say. Uh, so when we approach the father in prayer, we approach someone who has authority over our lives. So that's what it means when Paul approach God, pray to God for Christians, for you and me, to the Father. He approached someone with authority over your life. See, not only that God is powerful, not only that he is loving, but he also has authority over you. See, sadly, we live in a time today where the word authority often invokes a, a, a negative picture, isn't it? A negative connotation rather than a positive one. But that's not what the Bible um, convey when it talks about authority of God over our lives. It's not a negative thing. It's a positive thing. It's a good thing. Well, why is it a good thing? Why authority of a father is a good thing? Well, look at verse 15. Verse 15 says this, Paul prayed to the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. See, what kind of a father is our God? He's the kind of a father who named each of you, each of us. He named each of us. See, to name someone or something 
is to speak of authority over the person he named or the thing he named. It speaks about identity, you see. See, God named each of us. Yet, if, if you remember in the book of Genesis, who named the animals? Adam and Eve. God gave charge to the creatures, to human, to name the animals. He says, like, you name these animals, you have authority over them. You rule over them, but God named each of us. He has authority over us. It speaks about our identity. See, if God named you, this is what it means. He's saying that you are his, that you are under his care and protection. So as a parent, uh, the, the privilege that you have is you are given, uh, you are naming your child, your son, your daughter. When you name your son, when you name your daughter, this is what you're saying. I am the authority over you. You are now under my care and my protection. So if you're a Christian, you, you may be growing up without, without an earthly father or a father who is not good to you, but you have God the Father who is all-powerful, all-loving, and he named you. He looks at you today and say, you are special, you are mine, and I will provide for you. Whatever that you need, I will provide for you. To the point that your enemies are my enemies. So that is who Paul is praying to, the Father. Now that leads us to our second point. So what is Paul praying for? Um, he's praying to the Father, but what is he praying for? Before we look at exact, what exactly Paul is praying for Christians, for you and me, I want to briefly mention Paul's posture when he prayed for Christians. Verse 14, we, we, may, we may, because we read it so fast, so quickly, we may miss it. Verse 14 says Paul was on his, knee, on his knees when he prayed. Now, you may not find it odd, but this is not a common posture of praying. Uh, for the usual prayer posture for, for a Jew, like Paul, is standing. They, they don't pray kneeling down. They pray standing up. So the fact that Paul was bowing on his knees speaks of the seriousness of his prayer, the importance of it, and also speaks of his love, his deep love for Christians, for the church. Uh, so Paul really, in a sense, this is what it, it conveys. Paul really, 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 really wants Christian to get these things that he's praying for them. Okay, so now let's look at what, what is Paul praying for? So verse 16, so Ephesians 3 verse 16, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. See, so many Christians are, are living a weak Christian life, powerless life, no authority. Paul prays for them that you may be strengthened with power. So the first thing that Paul is praying for is that they, Christians, you and I, may have power. And how do we have this power? Be, well, through the Holy Spirit. He say, strengthen with power through his spirit, through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. That is our power. And then verse 17, the first part of verse 17 say is this, so that Christ Jesus may dwell in your hearts through faith. Do you see that? So that Christ may dwell in your heart, in your life, through faith. So the second thing that Paul is praying for is that they may have intimacy with Jesus. Not only that they strengthen with power through a spirit, but that Christ may dwell in your heart so that we may have intimacy with God. Not just knowing about God, but have relationship with God. To know about someone is different to, than to have relationship with someone, right? Uh, we, we, we know 
who who uh, who Joe Biden is, the American president, or who Donald Trump is, uh, but we don't have relationship with them. So when you become a Christian, uh, Jesus dwells in your heart. It becomes intimate. Not only that Jesus takes residence in your heart, lives in your heart, in you, he, he becomes the authority, the owner of your life. Your life is now guided by Jesus, not by your own desires. This ought to change our prayer. We no longer pray just for the pragmatic things. I'm not saying that praying for the pragmatic things, the practical things is, is useless. Yeah, we got to pray for those, but they are not important anymore. Not so important anymore. The priority has dropped when Jesus is the authority and take residence in our life. What we pray, our desires has changed. We desire godliness more than wealth. We desire holiness more so than the success in, in our career life, you see. So Paul prays, the second thing that Paul's pray for is that they may have intimacy, that Jesus dwell in them. So the third thing that Paul is praying for is that they, they, that they Christians, you and I, experience the love of Christ. That's from verse 17b to verse 18. He says this, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend or to grasp with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth of Christ's love. So Christians need to experience Christ's love. And, and that's what Paul is praying for, that we, we not only know about it, but we, we experience Christ's love. Now, previously in chapter one, this is our first, very first sermon on, on the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter one, verse three. We've seen how Paul says that if you are a Christian, you have every spiritual blessing. Remember that? Not some. If you're a Christian, if you put your faith in Jesus, you have every spiritual blessing. Now, why did now Paul need to pray for Christian all these things if they already have them? Do you think about that? So in chapter one, Paul says, if you're a Christian, you have every spiritual blessings. Now Paul pray for specific things, specific blessing for them to have. Have you ever wondered why? If we already have it, why Paul bow on his knees? This is important for Paul that the Christian have this. The reason is because we may have them, but we don't tap into it. We don't experience it. And Paul wants them not just to know that they have them, that you and I have this spiritual blessing, but we must experience it. We should experience it. We should tap into them. So Christians are, are children who have been adopted by the Father, yet oftentimes we're still living like an orphan. We know we are adopted, but we don't experience as a son and a daughter of God. We still live like an orphan, you see? And that's the problem. And that's what Paul is praying for them. Yes, they already have them. You already have them. I already have them. If you're a Christian, we don't experience them yet, though. Uh, we, we don't tap into them. And that's what Paul is praying for them. So we have access to the power through the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Spirit. But often we, we are power, powerless against the temptation of sin, right? We give in instead of resisting and winning, have victory over the temptation. So as children of God, uh, we have rich inheritance as well in the kingdom of God. But do we access them? Do you access them? See, it... Maybe it's just something that is stored away. Yes, I'm, I'm a children of God. I'm a son and daughter of God. The, I'm heirs to the kingdom of God. But sometimes we live so like a beggar still. Uh, Paul's, Paul's prayer here is that he wants Christians, you and I, to access them. To not just know that we have them, but to access them. In a way, he's saying, don't live like an orphan. If you're a Christian, don't live like, like an orphan. You are sons and daughters of the most high God. Remember that. When, when people don't value 
you of who you are, remember, don't, don't beat yourself up. Remember, you are precious in the eyes of our God, our Father. Don't live like a beggar. You are heirs of the kingdom of God. God who owns everything. He say you will inherit the kingdom. So it is one thing, uh, if we learn what something today is this, that it, it is one thing to know that you have every spiritual blessing, but it is totally another or different thing to live and experience it. And that's what Paul is praying for, for you and for me this morning. So it is no good uh, to just know that God is love, he is loving, if you do not experience the love of God in your life. If you just know a lot about God, um, it will not do much for you apart from making you puffed up with knowledge. But when you experience God's love, you'll be transformed. Uh, you will be secure. You, will, you don't need people's approval to be happy. Um, so when people disapprove of you, when people hate you, uh, speak behind your back, you, you don't get depressed. You don't need their approvals. You have the approval of God. You don't need, you don't no longer crave for people's love. So when you love someone and they don't love you back, you don't feel offended. You say, I've, I've got God's love. Now, that's the key. Uh, to uh, to uh, to to a maturity in 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 a Christian life, in to for us to grow into Christ likeness, is to not just know about God, but to experience God's love for us. So when you read the Scripture, see there's three part of growing into maturity in into into a spiritual health. It's not just reading the Scripture because the reading of the Scripture uh, fill up our mind, right? So we pray about it as. As you read carefully, it should move us to prayer. So when you read, God is speaking to you. And when you pray, you're speaking to God. But when you meditate on God's word, that's when the magic happens. That's when God speaks to you and transforms you. That's when you struggle with God's word and let God's word speak into your life and correct you and mold you and rebuke you, you see? So don't just read it, don't just pray for it, but let it change you, let it shape you, experience God's word in your life. And that's what Paul wants Christians in Ephesus to experience. Now, Jonathan Edwards, an, an American Puritan, explained, explained it in, in a beautiful way, in this way. He said, there's a difference uh, between having an opinion that God is holy and gracious and having a sense of the loveliness and the beauty of that holiness and grace. So there's a difference between having a rational judgment that honey is sweet and having a sense of its sweetness. See, this is what he's saying. There are two ways to taste honey, uh, to know. Oh, there's two ways to know the taste of honey. Uh, the first way is to read about it in literature, to read about its sweetness. But there's another way to know the taste of honey. How? To taste it, to taste its sweetness. See, Paul asks, Paul wants Christians, want you and me, to not just know about the love of God, but he wants us to taste it. Do not just know the, the, that honey is sweet, but to taste the sweetness of honey to experience the love of God. So that is what Paul prays for. So finally, the third point is why is Paul praying for them? Um, what's the reason? So look at verse 19. Verse 19 says this, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's the goal that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, that you may be more like Christ, you be like God. See, the reason for Paul's powerful prayer for Christian is so that Christian may become like Jesus. See, our, our goal as Christian is, 
is really, really high, isn't it? The standard is high to be like Jesus, to be filled with the fullness of God. Can you imagine that? Your life full of God. That's the goal. Very high standard there. See, the goal of Christian is Christ-likeness. One, I like how one writer says it. He says this, the goal of Christianity is not getting us to heaven, but getting heaven into us. See, the process of becoming like Jesus or sanctification is, is difficult. It's not easy and, and often can be painful process. When you pray to God, God, make me become patient like Jesus. You know what's going to happen? God will send someone so annoying into your life to make you patient like Jesus. Or when, when you pray to God, God, make me generous like Jesus. You know what God will do when you pray like that? He said, well, God will perhaps will put you in a community full of needy people. People who want your help, who want so much of you. See, when that happened, what, I, what are you going to do then? When you pray, God, make me patient. God, give you someone annoying in your life. And when you say, God, make me generous, and God put you in a community full of needy people, what are you going to do then? Well, you have two options. The first option is to trust God in the process, however painful and difficult it may be. You say, I'm going to stick with this. I know, God, this is hard. This, this is so difficult for me. It's so painful for me. But I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust the process. That's the first option. The second option is to run away. Uh, to find less annoying or less needy people to be around. You say, God, I, I, I can't do this. These people are too needy um, or too annoying or too whatever. I, I, I can't deal with this. See, if you choose the latter, the second one, um, um, trust me, you, you may be, perhaps you may be a Christian for, for 20 years now, but all you have is just one year maturity repeated 20 times. You're, you're not more mature today than a year ago. If you keep running away, rather than let God, trust God, shape you through the people around you through the community that God put around you to make you more like Jesus. You may be Christians for 20 years, but all you have is one year maturity 20 times repeated. It's like going to, let, let me explain this. It's like going to a school uh, for 20 years, but repeating kindergarten every year. Yes, you say, I've, I've been in this school for 20 years, but all you learn is kindergarten materials. See, sadly, a lot of Christians are like that. They grow for the first three years, but then they just repeat that first three years for the rest of their Christian life. They're not growing more patient. They're not growing more selfless. They're not growing more loving. See, are you more patient today than last year? Are you more generous today than last year? See, if you choose the first to trust God, however painful it is, the process, you will grow year on year. Trust him. You will grow. You'll be more patient today than yesterday. You'll be more generous today than yesterday. See, the Apostle Paul says this, that every Christian has every spiritual blessing available to them. But yet at the same time, he prays for them to have them, to grasp them, to comprehend them, to wrestle with them. Paul wants us to experience them, not to just know about all this loving truth, amazing truth about who God is and who you are in Christ Jesus, that you are son and daughter of the Most High God. Not just know them, but experience them. Now, let me tell you all of us a story, uh, and I'm going to close with that. See, there was an old couple, two old couple, who desired all their life to experience a holiday on a, on a luxurious cruise liner, the, you know, one of those really big cruise liner. 
with like five swimming pool, with everything that you can imagine. Um, so because they are not rich, they are simple people, they, they don't have much, right? So every year they decided not to go on holiday, but to put the money, the little money that they have away, saving it. So they save this year on after year, year after year. So after many years, they, they, one day they save just enough to get two tickets, to spend 14 days, two weeks, at the most luxurious cruise liner the world has ever seen. So they use all their savings for the tickets and have nothing left to spend on the cruise to, to shop or to do anything, really. They spend everything on the tickets. So every day during their, their trip, the two weeks in the cruise liner, they enjoy walking around the cruise, uh, the scenery and all the stuff. It's a beautiful place. Uh, they, but they could only look at other passengers enjoying their uh, amazing buffet, having their meals, you know, like so many food. But when they got hungry, they retreated to their room and cook a cup of instant noodles and share between the two of them. And, and that's all they did. They enjoy the cruise, but you know, when they want to eat, they, they, they eat a cup of instant noodles. And they did that every day until one day on the last day of their cruise trip, they met another couple. So they chatted about how amazing the experience has been for them and how, how long they've been saving uh, for this trip. And uh, they keep talking and, and their new friends asked them to join them for lunch at the amazing buffet. And they replied kindly and sadly say, oh, no, we, we, we cannot afford that. Uh, we use all our money on the tickets. And the new friends then say to them, oh, no, 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 no. They already paid for. When, when, when you bought your ticket, they're included. You can have everything in this cruise ship. You already paid for them. It's paid when you paid for your ticket. See, they didn't know that. See, on the cross of Jesus Christ, Jesus paid it all. See, other religions say this. You must do this to get to heaven. If you, want, if you want to be like this or like that, you must do this or that. There's so many things you must do. But only Jesus, the God of Christianity, that says on the cross, Jesus says, it is finished. No other religion says that. There's always something for us to do. But in Christianity, Jesus said it is finished finish it's paid in full have you experienced that or you just know that in your head but you have not experienced that maybe we you still living like that couple who enjoy a christian life on that cruise ship but you retreated into your room and have that instant cup noodles full of msg rather than enjoying the amazing buffet that god has provided for you so that's it paul prayer for christians for you and me do not just know that God is loving, but to experience the love of God. You have access to power, a powerful life in Jesus. You are loved by the Father, the Most High God. Do you just know that or you experience that? See, this message this morning is this. You don't have to live like an orphan anymore. You don't have to live like a beggar anymore because on that cross, if you are a Christian, if you put your faith in Jesus, on that cross, Jesus say, it is finished. Let us pray.